if it doesn't fit in the British Museum, you don't get to have it either. Welcome to She Has a Point, episode one. We are going to talk about, in this episode, we are going to talk about sort of international student life and experiences. And we want to dabble in the topic of over tourism because this is, you know, an introduction to this podcast and us. But Frankie, in general, why did we start this podcast and what do we want to talk about? Because I honestly think we were sending WhatsApp voice messages that are at least five minutes long to each other going, our opinions are fabulous. And I also thought every other man in this this world has a podcast, so why can't we have one? Except we'll cite our sources rather than just pulling figures out of our arse. So here we are. Yeah. Yes. The the WhatsApp back to back messaging, I think easily we were probably listening to 30 minutes of each other every single day. Oh, we still do. We're gonna talk in this podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're still, still going on. Of <laughs> um yeah, so in this podcast, to all of our audience listeners, um we want to talk about like international relations, global history being like international students slash expats I would love to get into that word expats at some point yes that's that's such a I was even talking about this like expats versus immigrants I'm like why are we called expats or we call ourselves expats but suddenly it's someone with a slightly darker skin tone is an immigrant like well that's that's very uh interesting thing to unpack in another episode if we make it to it (laughs) yeah so that and the combating the patriarchy, which I almost feel like ties in, like will tie in when we talk about the word expat and so many other things. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we've got to start by introducing ourselves, I guess. Okay, yes. So I'm Kylie and I'm American. This is... Frankie and I'm British. I am coming to you, not live, because I'll be posting this later but I'm coming to you from southern Virginia where it is in Fahrenheit 90s and Celsius like 30s lower 30s so that's if you need to run to sweat like that's the reason she's sweating it's not because (laughs) of the pressure uh and I'm coming to you from the northeast of Scotland we met um we met about two years ago when we joined up for a master's program. We, our master's was in international war studies. So we met in Germany for the first time and we continued loving each other <laughs> into sunny Dublin. Yes, yes. Um, Ironically, uh, Kylie and I did not get on when we first met. That's more of my part than her part, which I'm sure we'll unpack. The greatest female friendships formed when we didn't like each other at the start. So that foundation is strong. And yeah, we've known each other for coming up two years, which is kind of insane. Uh, And Kylie likes me so much that she's coming over to Scotland to study her, her next degree in Glasgow. Yes, I would say I'm chasing Frankie, but unfortunately, she's decided that I'm not worth her time. (laughs) She's headed to China. Yes, yes, I depart, hopefully in two weeks, visas pending. Um, We all know the visa. Well, we don't actually. I did not know anything about visas until we left the EU. And even now, I didn't really know anything about visas until this process. It's so stressful. I don't know how people who do it, who don't have like, freedom to Rome do it often it's insane yeah well so we had to when we were in Germany right we had to get residence permits which weren't like terrible right like it's a really it's kind of scary going to the I think what the office is called Auslander Borda also was yours super far away in Berlin because mine was like a two hour to book an appointment Berlin bureaucracy to try and actually book an appointment you have to travel two hours and like hope on the blue moon that you'll get into an appointment because well maybe because I was doing it so late and I was also fun fact guys I also got late I got in late to our course so I didn't know many people when I moved to Berlin I didn't know anything which we'll get into in a bit 
but I had to travel so far for mine and I had to book it as a really random appointment. But my guy was Prussian. So he was like, oh, you're studying in Potsdam? You're doing this? I'm Prussian. And then he like gave me a really good visa. So I was like, ah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, I wasn't living in Berlin, so I didn't have to, my, my permit yeah. wasn't from Berlin, um, but it was super, super, super hard to get appointments. And on the appointment, right, like, so, like, I would like to say that I speak, like, elementary German, right? Like, I can understand, you know, what some people are saying, as long as they're not, like, speaking at, like, a philosophical level. But especially when I first got there, the first couple of months, like, I was in, like, German A22, like, I could, like, order at a pub and, like, maybe flirt a little. And that's it. <laughs> in half <Washington>. of <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly I couldn't even think of a German word to flirt with I went with Oshante <laughs> genau genau um <laughs> <That was good. laughs> yeah 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 um yeah, two C um <laughs> so no but I am so scared about not being able to understand them so I brought the wife of one of our classmates she was so nice to go with me oh was that um Paul's wife yeah yeah oh, she course, so nice she to go so many me. languages yeah yeah so she like helped me out um I was the first though to like get it of like all of the non you're more organized than most of us bar maybe one I say Shannon Shannon and you are the peak of organization everyone else is like how do I do this <laughs> <Afterwards>. <laughs> shared our like I don't know checklist. knowledge yeah yeah but we had, I mean, I had to have like two copies of everything. Mm. Um, it was, but I mean, at least when I got it, I had to like, it just lasted for a year and it was only, I think a hundred. Yeah. It was a hundred euro for me. Yeah. Mine lasted for three years. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> I don't know. He's because he seemed to think my course was going to last for ages. So mine still works till twenty twenty four. I don't know if I'm getting him. I, no one knows it's who gave me the visa. So if I'm getting in trouble, but oh, fun fact about the visa thing. Do you know you have to fill out a form and like you have to sign it in Germany. You have to sign everything physically, basically. I left that form on my table and went to the appointment, and I almost broke down crying. And he's like, "Chill, come. There's a form here. Fill it out." chill and I, but you know you know in that situation you've been waiting weeks yes. printing everything off hoping you've got everything and lots of stuff is not in English again it's our fault for coming to a country not speaking the language yeah. uh but it's still that thing of oh my god I've forgotten the one thing I'm supposed to bring the form like everything else is there except the form so that was my experience it was not fun um Honestly, the most stressful thing was that, so when you're an international student, you have to prove that you have a means of supporting yourself for, mm. right? And so you, can, like, I think that they're kind of a little bit, they aren't as strict in Berlin. This is according to like, like Reddit users on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the trustworthy source that is Reddit. <laughs> But so I, a bunch of the Americans, I think like all of us for the most part, we um, had to put money into a blocked account. So we put our money in and then they disperse bits to us back each month. But you put yeah. in money for a year and it's like almost 900 euro a month. So you have to go prepared with 12, like it was basically the equivalent of like $12,000 in a bank account which I feel like is something that people just like don't talk about with going abroad that's like you have to prove yeah that. I my yeah my parents couldn't um produce that much money or I can produce that much money and I there's not really a loan system in Scotland that allows for like big loans to be taken out at once they'll feed trip feed and they don't really allow for masters so what I had to do is prove my parents could support me and they had to guarantee me as a, like a guarantor and they had to send in their paychecks for six months to prove that like they were going to earn enough to support me so that's the avenue I took but he barely looked at it again yeah I would say that yeah I that's the thing I think like bureaucracy is, is sometimes it is very strict but usually when it's geared towards students I think they do have an understanding of you're not doing it maliciously like most people aren't you don't break the rules maliciously and what I will say we're both like very privileged individuals and oh, yeah. we come from um countries that 
like we're often given the benefit of the doubt, um, especially in Europe. And so I think that it like perhaps unfairly helped us like where our passports were coming from oh definitely like i think compared to like i remember seeing tiktok my information source that um like a, i think it was a nigerian woman she's explaining she has to give up her passport for like three to six months sometimes to gain a visa and i was like that's insane to me like i wouldn't like my visa my passport leaving me for you know a few minutes or a few days let alone like three to six months that's restricting your travel yeah absolutely and it's also just like feels like almost like a threat to your personal safety because that's like the ultimate identification document and like for for myself britain just leaving the eu rip um my rights but the whole thing of this this like a almost weird relationship as well like with ireland i didn't have to do anything to go to ireland so our courses in berlin one year in dublin the next so in ireland um we there's a special relationship so I just have to kind of show up and not do anything um and then I just have to apply for like a PPSN number which is like the, if I wanted to work but again the relationship was so smooth um I don't know what your process is like for you guys so they have like quite a few different requirements based on where you're from in the world and Americans have to do like a lot of the same things that other people have to do but in terms of funding I think we really need to prove that we have like 3,000 euro in our bank account um and you could just like print out a statement so that's what I did and then it cost 300 euro and but I think like we had one classmate who was from outside of the EU and outside of North America only oh both. yeah and like you like you were the only like the British folk um and I think that she had to prove she had 6,000 so when you get it in Germany you bring your own like passport photo and like I had gone to a day m I think with mm. our good friend Shannon to get it done right and the girl was amazing and I took one picture and she was like like, I think we can do better, right? And I look, like, good. I'm not sure I've ever had a better picture done in my life. Whereas in Ireland, you know the thing? They have, like, a, they have like a yeah. camera. You, you, you go to these, like, like booths, basically. And you, like, slide out your documents over. And so we didn't talk that much. And then all of a sudden, he's like, okay, look to your left. um, Like, and that's where we'll take a picture. And I'm like, wait, what? Right? And I'm like... In the picture, it's like, and then my photos me like, <laughs> oh my god, no, mine, mine, oh my god, I have two stories about photo booths. Firstly, my ones for Berlin, cursed, absolutely cursed. I'm like in Espan, you know, like you remember the end of Espan station had the photo booth right underneath me trying to take speedy pictures right before my appointment, so it looks horrendous. I look like someone's mum. And then secondly, there was this club back in Aberdeen where I did my undergraduate and there was this video going around of this girl pissing in it. Like you could just see her legs in a trail of pee because she was so drunk. She like thought it was a toilet. And this little video was circling for ages of this girl peeing in this photo booth. Um, (laughs) Welcome to Scottish culture. I think it didn't use the photo booth because like you had to have an exact change it was like 17 euro or something like that it was like totally and it didn't give change back and I think I only had a 20 or something and I was like and de- at like at the store it was like five or something I think uh, it's better when you have a human being doing it because you can kind of relax otherwise you're counting down and then you're it just seems like a fifth faff um yeah. I actually just got photos for my visa from Timpsons here I look rotted and the girl was like they're good and I I couldn't say no but they're rotted like they are disgusting and listen I can't I have to look at them now they'll be on my visa for China for the next 12 months and I just kind of was like I'm gonna have to accept it because there's nothing I can do to make you take them again and she like printed them off already and I was like um do you are so like my visa okay so now I'm obviously going to the UK and when I was in Germany and Ireland, I didn't have to get a visa. I just had to get a residence permit. Mm. And so that was a lot simpler. Like I could go and do it in the country. 
and a lot cheaper <laughs> but with the UK I had to like do like a proper visa process beforehand and then it's like in your passport right is that what yours yeah. looks like that's and... what I'm going to get yeah tomorrow well um yeah so I had to get all my documents authenticated on this side so I have to like prove my degree prove my I have no criminal background and prove I have a TEFL because I'm going to go and teach out there so it's a TEFL to teach English as a foreign language certificate and then they get sent to China and then China processes them in their bureaus, their local bureaus. And then they send it back to you to say, like, you've been, it's a notification of an invite to apply for a visa. And I go and get a visa that's worth for valid for 90 days. Mm. I have to change it to a residence permit within 30 days. It's like, it is that thing of, I think it's so much stricter and there's no special agreement that I know of. Uh, between China and the UK like again I think certain countries have special agreements that speed things along a lot yeah. um but yeah it's it's definitely been a like a learning experience and I'm I must admit, I'm cutting it by the, the skin of my teeth and my one tip to people who are applying to do courses abroad anywhere and if you know it's a visa process like really be prepared for that sort of stuff because I wasn't and for quite a few times I've gone when I went to Germany I wasn't prepared and when I went to I'm going to China I'm not prepared uh and I've noticed like it's so much more stressful and you're actually often paying for it financially because you're having to express stuff a lot faster so one tip you can take away from this podcast is do your paperwork in advance um don't leave it to the last minute actually something that I want to mention because so many Americans like I feel like if we're going to go anywhere we often go to the UK um something that I want to talk about real quick because I just like want transparency on these sorts of things and money's like a taboo topic right but like I don't know you just like need people to yeah to be transparent about these sorts of things so obviously in Ireland uh in Germany I paid 100 euro and then in Ireland it was 300 and I felt like in Ireland it was so much money but to go and then um in Germany you have to pay for health insurance which was like 1200 euro over the year I think um in Ireland they make you get private health insurance which depends on your age um and for me because I was 23 it was like less than 400 euro not that the health insurance comes for the, literally for the whole year or for per month for a year but again, because okay. it doesn't do anything. It doesn't even pay for your appointments. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember speaking to locals about it. They were like, it's, they have a whole, like, I can't comment on it too much because I, I didn't have to use the healthcare out there, but their system, I think, is not doing well, Uh, was the phrase I got given. Uh, If you want anything, it's going to take a long time to do anything. But China, probably to do the visa process, it's costing me about a hundred, a thousand pounds to do everything this is includes like so this has to be all verified then you have to get a TEFL which is about at least 100 pounds so to get it verified I chose a service because it's faster than me traveling because I live so far away from the uh, visa center so that cost me about 400 and something pounds so you're already up to 500 pounds then I have to go down to China the visa center in China, uh, Edinburgh again which is going to be probably another 200 pounds plus travel so it's starting to eat up so I would just say to people as well if you're looking to like teach abroad English and be like oh everything's gonna be like so cheap like you have to put up a lot of money up front so just a like word of advice have some savings before you go into it so I kind of thought oh the paycheck's good so I'm just gonna like be easy breezy but I'm having to spend a lot of money up front and that's really like not not being easy I guess so yeah a word of advice yes I'm going to connect my airpods because it is not quiet and I thought that um okay so yeah so going to the UK they have you pay for the visa and health insurance for sort of the length of your course up front and so the length of my course was it's two years that like I'm going into I'll have to do like a third year of something and then I'll have to renew my visa from within the country which would be more expensive and pay for it another year of health insurance but so to pay for the visa it's 480 dollars 
health insurance is nearly sixteen hundred dollars. It's fifteen hundred sixty six dollars. I don't really. I, don't, I think it's like. It's obviously the numbers typically in pounds, but depending on where you're applying from, they charge you in your home currency. Yeah. Um, and then you have to go and get your biometric residence permit things done. So they look at some documents to verify you are who you say you are, and then you do your fingerprints. And oh, yeah, oh, those, that's the big the, thing, fingerprints. Yeah, so you need to leave like at least three weeks for this, but obviously I would like do these things earlier. Um, but the appointment, I think, for your biometric residence permit can be different. But because like I was in a little bit of a rush, I wanted to do the center that was in Philadelphia because I'm from the mm. Philadelphia area. And that appointment alone was $240. So I paid, I think, like nearly $2,200 for um, a UK visa stuff, which felt crazy to me. And it's just like one of those like financial barriers, which is... I don't know like it's kind of unfortunate because going and studying abroad is like it's difficult to privilege it's one of those things that you don't realize that you know you can't use like student loans for if that's what you're depending on for your course or whatever yeah just to keep in mind yeah um so with that I think we're going to start talking about our experiences as international students in Berlin the city of uh, I don't know endless partying as some people um like to think of it as yeah so we had different experience so I was living in Berlin I was living in Potsdam which is like sorry a I town forget. like slightly <laughs> I know sorry I wasn't I wasn't living in the capital I was living mm. in Brandenburg capital of Brandenburg which is where Olaf Schultz lives so. okay so when I like headed to Potsdam I I applied okay so I graduated from my undergrad in May 2020 and then I had a year of just like working but that allowed me to prepare for grad school and apply to grad school like quite early and so I got into this program early and well early-ish but still not early enough that I would have known to apply for housing in Potsdam to get into the student back housing which is the like subsidized yeah. student housing so for my first six or seven months I was paying for yeah. private accommodation private student accommodation which still wasn't awful like I did have my own little studio and it was right next to a train station but I mean it wasn't like cheap did you guys have a bus Ireland, as well yeah we had a bus we took a bus to class every day but it was still right near the Golm train station so we could take that right into yeah. Berlin yeah yeah um I do remember like most of our compatriots went for that because um in in Germany you have this thing called um a VG. I'm not gonna pronounce it in German because people are gonna roast me online. But um it's basically like a shared accommodation. Yeah. I'm sure I'll get roasted. Yeah, everyone just calls it a VG. And there's like a website geared up for it. And when I applied, so I applied late. I graduated in June twenty twenty one and this course started in October twenty twenty one. So you can see I went speed turn around um and the like one thing they said was like Potsdam so you start looking in Potsdam and you're finding nothing and you're finding everything's extortionate so I on my own winded in a search to Berlin and was like oh this is so much better but again Berlin's massive so you don't know where you're searching so you're kind of looking at like recently Berlin traditionally is divided into east and west so you're looking at more west Berlin and you're also looking at uh, like southwest, which is Zehendorf, uh, which is next Schoenberg, and it's kind. Of, I lived in Zehendorf, guys. I know it's bougie. I know it's not the true Berlin, um, but my accommodation was nice. So, um, and yeah, my true Berlin people roasted me, even though he's from Zehendorf, and I was like, I don't, I don't know out uh, two of us who's a bougie bitch, but I think it's you who lives here and owns a house here, not me um but yes I it was stressful it was stressful because um I came to Berlin with no accommodation and I had to, I booked a hostel for two weeks I also came very ill like like chest infection ill um to Berlin which was horrible and I had to hunt for accommodation at that time but there was there was um an international office who had like some housing 
and I got my first set of housing through that because it was like someone who who went to Potsdam University who said I have a room and she she owned the building um very nicely and she owned this one flat in the building and um like she put a room up and I went for an interview and she had one other person to interview afterwards and um she chose me which was quite lucky because I it was a really nice place it was probably more pricey for Berlin at the time but I kind of just wanted somewhere where I could live and not like feel shit about anything so um yeah it was clean do you seem really nice yeah no it was stressful and I know that like there's like housing shortages everywhere right and the housing crisis cost of living crisis like crises of all sorts um we live in unprecedented times <laughs> but like it, it was wild that even in Hostam like um another friend of ours he came later and he stayed in a hostel for a while mm. before he found housing in Potsdam but it was in I think it was in Babelsberg I think it was in Babelsberg so he wasn't even like especially close to the university yeah I mean I think you soon realize the community I mean you're you were in your seconds so Kylie moved of course as she said kind of like six months in and I went to her place it was really good because the pricing was so good the location was amazing and I would often like pick her up as I went into class so I would like get get off on the bus or get off on the train with her and then just take it with her because I took three trains the combination I had to take because the indoor was kind of out the way so I had to kind of go up to come out um did you do SS to yeah I did S7 to S1 and then the big, the big trains, like the the hundred or something like that, um, like the inter province trains, basically. Or I took the bus with you, um, and you realize like being close to transport is so important as a student because you can bike it, but it's a long old bike, um, and most of us don't have bikes if we live if we're international because either you ship a bike or you buy a bike, they get stolen a lot in Berlin. Apparently, there's like a massive amount of bike theft in Berlin interesting and I'm not Dutch so I barely know how to bike honestly (laughs) I rode a bike for the first time in years actually I rode a bike in Bologna for like 10 seconds and I had had a few drinks like admittedly I'd had a few drinks but I'm like I could still bike you know what I'm saying like you never like you never forget how bad a bicycle you you definitely can (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 um, um but like okay so finding housing in Germany though which was stressful for me I'd only found housing in Philadelphia before I thought Germany was like a little stressful and then and then after a year I was like I had lived in I had lived in Germany for a little over a year we had to start looking for housing in Dublin Mary <laughs> Joseph and Jesus combined I distinctly remember a professor of ours going, oh, just band together and get a house. I made it sound so easy. And whoever has ever tried to do university in Dublin, who is not from Dublin, and even people from Dublin, if they want to move out, they will know the horror shit show that is um, Dublin housing, period. Yes. So like a bunch of us had like, we were like, oh, we're going to look for a house or a flat to rent. And some of us, like different groups of our cohort, some people had decided that they would do student housing, but that was like mad expensive. And I thought like, oh, I can get something cheaper than that. Wrong for sure. Naivety. Um, <laughs> I thought that I was, I was the exception. I'm not the exception. Oh God. Yeah. Um, so yeah like a few of us and one of the individuals who I was like at the time planning or slash hoping to live with went to Dublin for one or two weeks one or two and was paying for a hostel the whole time went to like several different showings we all applied to these houses immediately nothing yeah yeah I I, I mean it's I I didn't even get to go there because like for me it was not the point like we ended up going through a, a company. It's called Hosting Power. Uh, we're not sponsored. Uh, 
but they will ship no, me. No, we are the- not sponsored. Pain. Um, and they kind of take a fee, but they find you, and they're like, they all, they've checked out the accommodation because there's so many scammers out there. Um, and no, like, but I, but I found sorry I'm interrupting you but I found out they don't actually go to all these houses because they hadn't gone they hadn't actually visited that house oh. that I lived in oh yeah Kylie has a nightmare which she won't speak about because I think she's still a little bit traumatized but they, oh yeah now remembering their policy they said like they verified it in some way basically to check that you the housing was what it was um I think it's just to basically see if a house was standing there almost uh more than anything so you did that, so you paid them quite a hefty fee, and then you contracted with them for a period. And I was quite, I feel like I was quite lucky with a couple. Um, I lived with an older couple, and I had another flatmate who is um from China, Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, and we were both quite lucky that they'd done it a few times before as well. So they had like two French girls before, and they had a Chinese girl before. Um, so they had experienced having people in the house, so they knew what it was like to have you know students and stuff um hovering around the house basically yeah so the people i lived with this was their first time now don't get me wrong dublin is like extremely 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 expensive but even with that i feel like i could have had some sort of fun um because i will say irish people are like often like i mean like the like irish stereotype at least among americans that like irish people are friendly i found to be mostly true that like yeah. people were outgoing and friendly and wanted to be kind to me, wanted to help me, that sort of thing. My host was super helpful. Lovely, they took me to the airport, picked me up from the airport. You know, that was very like the very nice people. My boss let me stay in her house over Christmas to cat sit, which she clearly did not need a cat sitter. But she was just like, "Do you want to? Do you want to do like Christmas on your own?" And I was like, "Yeah." And um, our, our mutual friend Shannon came down. We had Christmas at her place. It was great fun. Um, cat and us were chilling <laughs> <laughs> but so I guess like the moral of the story is that I would never do this again though I would never <laughs> live with a family the family I did briefly after another horrible experience live with the family that Frankie was living with and they were like much better right like comparatively um but still it was the sort of thing that was like I would never ever ever recommend anybody do this especially without meeting the family first yeah but as like 23 24 in some cases people were like 28 year olds living with other families and when you're living in their family home it's often difficult to get them to kind of view this room as separate from their their house because you're paying right for this room but none of us actually had the experience where the family wouldn't just go into the room when they felt like it um which in some cases like wasn't the worst ever um I mean often regardless felt like a little bit of a violation Mm. but I I, I do what you mean like it's equal ownership like I so again in Germany I lived with a girl she owned the building and owned the flat so it was kind of this weird thing of she's my landlord um and then I lived in digs for the second six months in Germany um and then I was just in a, just in another place in Zandorf uh I'm loyal to a fault uh and then yeah it was digs again technically and it was that thing of you're trying to change someone's mindset this is not just your family phone a home you're renting out this prop place so I'm going to be in here and it's just having that equal right to spaces where and when you're all flatmates nobody owns the property you're kind of like well I have equal access to the kitchen and if say something breaks we all I don't feel bad enough I'm not hurting you as a family almost um sorry that's my dog um but yeah I think if I could in the future I'd always avoid digs and I just caution people who are doing digs to be aware of this with I don't want to say power dynamic it is kind no, of it is. Power, it's dynamic. power dynamic it definitely is yeah. um yeah I'd say like even if it costs a little more money to do student housing which of course in my case it didn't cost more money uh anyway um like the pure peace of mind is definitely worth it not having to live with a landlord and not having to um 
sort of try to fit around someone else's life because like you want it to be like where you're living you want to be able to like come home and make dinner without being stared at that was a big issue for me yeah and that's a big thing like it's realizing that people are gonna have their lives of their own um as well it was just an adjustment to live um to live in yeah well okay so getting into like over tourism a little bit right because our struggles is was definitely related to dublin's over tourism problem um definitely like getting into the definition of over tourism like let me do this real quick um (laughs) The definition of over tourism as defined by Oxford languages is the phenomenon whereby certain places of interest are visited by excessive numbers of tourists, causing undesirable effects to the places visited. The term was sort of invented or popularized by skiff.com in 2016, and then it was shortlisted um, as word of the year in 2018 by Collins Dictionary. So it's sort of like a newly, I would say, recognized phenomenon or like spoken about phenomenon. But obviously it's been like, you know, 2016 is it when people started carving their initials into the Coliseum. People have been mm. tasteless yeah. before. I thought that was our guy. Like we had a debate about this. I thought, I thought that's a British guy. And she's like, no, it's an American. And I was like, oh, we claim the worst I think people. it's uh, American. Wait, let me, let me like double check that it was... Um, Initial carving coliseum. Swiss? Oh, Swiss tourists. Oh, the Swiss are back at it again. Oh, How no, less than a month Swiss- after 20. Oh, wait, wait, just kidding, just kidding. Oh. <laughs> it was a British, and then it was a Swiss. I thought okay. it was us. I was like, we claim our people. Uh... I really, Americans, anyway. If we can't steal um, it, we have to ruin it. <laughs> That's the way of the British. If it doesn't fit in the British Museum, you don't get to have it either. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> okay, but so... Obviously, like, tourism is a double-edged sword. Oh, um, a thousand percent. Which is, like, the case, of course, in in Dublin right like the that's my knee um like the we needed like they need the tours some money because like it helps the economy run like lots of jobs are related directly to tourism but but when tourism when tourists come they come with like money to spend oh yeah and in Dublin there's over four tourists to every one local and prices are Made for reflective the tourists, of not that for the locals yeah mm-hmm. definitely like the service industry even just like trying to go into the center of town like i lived in the north and i lived in the south and us meeting you had to add on at least 10 to 20 minutes on any transport because there was so much congestion in the center of town and just even getting in it it pushed back all bus times and all everything times and yeah you could see there was definitely like a drop in prices of like say what a pint costs from the center street by street almost mm-hmm. but like even the student bar was not cheap like I remember us telling uh, the Johnny who li- the son of the people I live with we told him the prices because he went to UCD way back in the day and he was like what is that it's that expensive and we're like yeah and he's like damn <laughs> Dublin's gone it's like 60, <laughs> like, I think, still yeah it's it's for a pint of cider and we don't get us wrong. Like, we spent plenty of time in the pubs. Like, oh, you yes. can't deter us completely, right? Like, there have to be, like, 20 for us to be like, no, I must no, find I'll, healthier. I'll bitch I'll about the it. price as I drink my beer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. As I tap my card, I will say a silent prayer. <laughs> um, but, like, when taxis are 30 euros for 15 minutes, I think I paid a 60, I think I paid 60 euros for a taxi once because I needed to get a ride home at, like, 2 a.m. Um, and then, like, luckily I had someone to split it with, but I had another time where I had to take a taxi home at, like, 2 a.m. at a different time, and I had no one to split it with. Again, that's on me. Like, the 2 a.m. thing is fully on me. No one's forcing me to stay up until 2 a.m., but... <laughs> the sessions maybe maybe (laughs) the gods above do you want me to have a good time (laughs) 
but like when prices are made for tourists who have budgeted three thousand dollars and i'm saying dollars because a lot of time it's like american tourists coming over like obviously americans are like okay well i mean this is my budget for the trip i'm gonna spend 30 euro on a taxi i'm going yeah. to spend like if i wanted to get four drinks in a night which like i think technically counts as binge drinking but and maybe not in Ireland, um, like, you'd be paying over 30 euro if you're, like, a lot of tourists are drinking in, like, Temple Bar, you're paying easily over 30 euro for, like, just At four least. pints of Guinness. Yeah, and that's, and that's the thing, like, not all the stuff on top of it, like, you're, I wouldn't say the tipping culture is super strong in Ireland, but it's, like, with Americans, of course, you bring your tipping culture with you, so you often do tip, um but yeah I just I was lucky I brought my car across so I acted as taxi a lot of the time for nights out like I remember specifically they'd be like oh do you want to do a night out and I'd be like okay and then they say do pre-drink somewhere and I'd be like do you know what? I'm just not going to drink um because the buses stop at a time they stop at half 11 and then it's a taxi and I'm like I am not paying yet 30 40 euros when I have a car I just want to drink and that kind of did put a dampener on things um and like just getting to the university was insane like this is a, this is another thing you need to consider when you're doing studying abroad abroad do you remember those videos that went around that was like I think abroad in, it's usually about Paris but um this guy in a beret um like you need to think about how close you are for transport to university, but also to other amenities. So I was an hour away from town, but 20 to 30 minute car ride from university. Um, I don't know, you were, you were an hour? I was an hour and a half to university. So it was the sort of thing, I was like, I'm leaving at 8 a.m. And I don't plan to get home until 8 p.m. because like, I'm gonna go to class, I'm gonna do work. And then you know what, I am gonna go to the student bar with my other fellow, like, basically commuters um, to make that three-hour round trip worth it. Yeah, and that's the thing you have to consider in a in a city that, like Ireland, that does not have great transport. Um, and ta again, taxis have a big say in this because they want the business. So they're going to keep saying, like, keep, don't put too much infrastructure in. Like, there is a Lewis and there is um, buses, but they're just always late. and. Like I think when we talk about the over tourism in uh, Ireland, I think it stems from like three or four factors. But the two big ones that jump out to me are like what we've coined the Game of Thrones effect, which we've stolen from someone else, I'm sure. And also like returning heritage, which Kylie could probably speak about a bit more. Uh <laughs> yeah, I mean, Americans, Americans love to be connected to where their ancestors came from, which is like, you know, fair to an extent because, you know, where our ancestors are from often dictates how we look, uh, maybe what foods we eat at home, but Irish Americans are like really passionate and it's almost like a pilgrimage um, for Americans, I feel like. And when tourists are going over there, they're obviously renting short-term rentals. They're Airbnbs, hotels, Airbnb is like super popular, obviously. And so like the housing market is geared towards short term rentals. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, speaking about these two like things, so I'm from Scotland and I, we are getting this effect now as well. And I think even said amongst your like peers and socioeconomic circle, you've noticed like much more people are going to Scotland now as a tourist Scotland's New Ireland Ooh, in my uh, like, small case study of just people I know <laughs> the local Philly area um but yeah I mean I just came back from a couple of days uh doing some of the North Coast 500 with my family and like we're from here so like it's a, just like touristing in your own backyard but we just went to Ullapool and stuff and like Loch Inver and stuff like this and it's like I saw pretty much the entirety of Europe cars on the roads almost almost got hit by a caravan because it was driving on the wrong side of the road. We also saw people f fist fighting in a passing place on like a w really narrow road. People had rocks. It was insane. We just drove past. <sighs> but like people need to understand like this stuff. There's no infrastructure. Like the people calling the police to stop this fight. 
that police is going to take an hour, an hour and a half, because first of the police aren't there often, but it's such like narrow roads and people are taking these massive camper vans and caravans that they've never driven before up these really windy roads. Um, and I forgot the name, this is a really famous road and I want to say Gerloch and it's insane. Like my dad's a very good driver and he's like, I was doing two mile an hour around them to make it around the corners and people are racing. But um, lots of, met a lot of Americans on that route actually, but we are having this effect as well. Um, and yeah, I live in the Highlands usually. And I think we have something like 1.6 billion pounds worth of investment in 2019. And also like you have to, when you're looking at these numbers, we encourage you to look at these numbers. You have to look at 2019 because we're still recovering from the pandemic. So your numbers are going to be skewed for 2020 to 2022 roughly. So like this year, you'll start to get more accurate views of what, tourism is like in your country yeah and like I feel like the effect of over tourism in when I look at places like Edinburgh and Glasgow and yes. Dublin is that well one there's a lot of internationals going there myself included my sister included <laughs> right like we're like I'm definitely like you can convict me of this um but it's like people on holiday rent out these airbnbs and of course landlords would rather have the airbnbs than rent to locals and so locals are left like literally stranded because you can make way more money as like you know charging 200 for airbnb a night plus the like 75 euro cleaning fee that you're gonna like have here on the <laughs> anyway yeah yeah the, and, and that's the thing like i edinburgh was really bad before like it became a touristy plot especially during like um the fringe there's this famous comedy festival. It's like a big festival of everything, but this is an art festival. And there's been cases of landlords driving up their rent by a thousand pounds during the month of, I think it's August. So they can appeal to people going to the fringe or participating in the fringe. And they also have this case in when the open, like this golf open was at St. Andrews. Like St. Andrews is really bad for housing anyway. Um, but during the golf opens, they drive up the price because all these rich people come across to watch the golf and they can afford you know 500 pounds a night because all the hotels are out and like golfing. people yeah people are getting kicked out of their house and I just think like this is not a sustainable model and it feels like we're always replying to it not doing anything about it um and again we're part of the problem we're not saying we're not like we're above everything we recognize that we are part of the problem but we're not driving it we're just trying to raise awareness of it I think more than anything Yes, yeah, so I did just like want to share some like, interesting numbers to illustrate my point. Um, and these numbers are from Dublin, um, from articles in from 2023, um, and then the other articles from 2018. See, in 2018, there was um, a, an insightful article from The Guardian where that was like titled 30,000 Empty Homes and Nowhere to Live Inside Dublin's Housing Crisis. And a large number of these homes are like jank homes. That's not like not an academic word. Are like, I'm going to just leave it as like basically inhospitable homes, like not habitable homes um, that the council like won't fix up. But then when you look at like rentals, okay, this is August, 2018. There were over 3,000 entire properties listed on Airbnb in Dublin compared to 1300 available for long-term rent then in 2023 we look at it where they actually started regulating it more over the past couple of years but it's still like in my opinion very poorly regulated where um there were 342 properties for rent according to daft which is just one website so it's not you know all properties whereas Airbnb had 376 whole home properties and this is like more in the center of Dublin so we see these, there's like literally more accommodation for travelers than there are for people who like, people who need to live in the city. Yeah. And this is, and this is the thing yeah. you're seeing, like okay, again, in Ireland in sort of chats with our peers, we noticed that there was a thing about schools, like there was not enough teachers for schools and not nurses. Like this is the big news story in Ireland. 
it's because they can't afford to live in Dublin or even just outside Dublin to then commute to then teach. So you're seeing a massive drain to Australia and New Zealand of all, and Canada to a certain extent as well of you know teachers, medics, and it's the same actually in the UK. We're seeing a massive drain because you're being priced out of areas and you're putting so much on rent that you can never save for a home. Um, and we've kind of drifted now from our chat about like being an international student, but it is something to consider when you're looking at places. Well, I mean, I will say like as international students though, like several of us, um, especially the American, quite a few of us were like, what if we graduate in Ireland, graduate in Dublin, and then try to find jobs in Dublin? The naivety uh, was like so five. good. <laughs> Okay, so you have to stay for five years to get that to get that passport. Unless you have like Irish heritage, which like one individual did. Like good for yes. him. Good for him. Um, or you need to find like a spouse, but I didn't have any luck with that. So um apparently the hard work was the way that I was intending to do it. Okay, but but so this housing crisis doesn't allow us to fulfill these international student dreams. And then we all head back to our mommy and daddy's houses. Yeah, that's kind um, of humiliating. Um, no, if you are living in your mom and dad's house in your 20s, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the timeline is different for everybody. However, of course, I think most of us can agree that for mental health reasons, it is, and just like freedom, like maybe like pride. It's It's nice to live not where your parents live and be able to prove to yourself that you can get a job in the place that you found desirable. Yeah, exactly. Like I think some of our peers went back to Germany and if I had known that was an option, so you could do our courses quite tight or you could do them spread across. I have done my three courses in one, like bash through it and then come back to Mm -hmm. Germany, probably because I really like looking back. I probably would have moved somewhere different in Germany, but in Berlin, sorry. And by we now knew local Berlin people who could put out the word for us, who had friends who were like moving on. And I, we also knew which areas were better to live in. Again, you're kind of, when you're, when you're an international student, you're kind of sold the tourist areas as a place to look for housing. Because like Berlin is very, I say, sectioned off in a way. And Definitely. I think I was told to like look in Schoenenberg and that's it. Whereas like, I think Neun- Colin is like the, I'm mispronouncing that, but that's like the good area to look for students because it's cheaper. And there's a lot of students. And now knowing that if I had to go back to Berlin, I would probably li- try to live around there because you can get good rent and like good people around there as well. And even in the East now, it's better because the transport, the transport's so good in Berlin, but you're definitely, as an international, you're competing with tourists basically for accommodation. Yes. So all of this is to say that like, um, being an international student is difficult, rewarding. I would do it all over again. If, yeah. like, if someone took away the last two years of my life, I'd be like, slay, let's do it again. <laughs> Especially last summer. Last summer was the best time of my whole life when we were oh, yeah, it was good in summer. Germany. It was, we just had so much fun. Our favorite pub in Berlin was actually an Irish pub run by Polish people. It was incredible. Um... Yeah, they had this um, shot but, thing that was an Irish flag. It's like three euro. We went through so many of those. I need a pool table. Oh, mm-hmm. it was so it was so good. It was so good. And the transport runs all night, so like we could go and stay there until midnight, and then take the S whatever to the next cocktail bar and just like kind of have a fun night, um, mingling with people meeting people and I don't know contribute to a better quality of life is the thing yeah definitely that work life balance I know people are like students don't work and it's like no we do like I mean uh, people again privileged position of I didn't have to work in Berlin to live but it was money was always a stress in the back of my mind um and then in Ireland I worked because otherwise my rent would not get paid um 
but you start to I know people like that's adult life and it's a very privileged position to complain about this but not even having the wherewithal to have like one drink with your friends once a month that was what that's what we're talking about to try and organize it to try and for people all to have the funds it was so much more mentally health healthy in Berlin because it'd be like okay a beer is a few euros your tickets already like your your semester ticket for transport's already paid for and it's massively discounted so you'd be like I don't even have to think when I hop onto the tram if my card's filled up like I'm just on it you just check it and then we yeah you just go somewhere for a drink or after class you just go and sit down and have some food or even just sit outside and be like I know I can still get a tram in an hour's time if we go for a walk not everything's about alcohol uh just most things um so it was like yeah I think the lifestyle was much healthier in Berlin yeah and like the thing with like our over tourism international student conversation is that like internationals international students have like a very interesting place within this whole mix because over tourism is can be harmful to residents and international students almost partake in that and are also victimized by it you know what I mean yeah definitely it's I think it's in a way international students if you're say Erasmus or you're international for a year you're usually there for at least six months and I think what from our research coming out of a lot of like over tourism solutions is people staying longer but in one place so you're not really like you're not seeing everything as quick financial like bucket list and that's the problem with bucket lists have been like I used to do the whole day off the coast I'm going to do Lisbon I'm going to do a Porto I'm going to book Barcelona it's this quick flying it's this quick you know quick use of everything as well um and they in a way as an international student you become part of the culture and you become part of the just area but you always will be different, especially if you don't speak the language. But even then, when you speak the language, you have a slight accent or you don't quite look right. We have a Bosnian compatriot who speaks fluent German, fluent German. But she says, I speak with a slight accent and they can spot it and they don't like it. Or if she speaks Bosnian first when she speaks English to us, it's that thing of they some I'm not saying it's, it's a German specific problem but I'm saying it's a cultural web problem and it's even in our own countries where we're like you don't speak English and it's like well we don't speak any other language so why are we complaining about but again it's a dichotomy like over tourism well like tourism sorry not like tur- over tourism is a bad thing tourism is the dichotomy what do you call <laughs> I'm not German for okay anyway what do you call someone who speaks three languages a polygon Trigal? Yeah, sure, but like, yeah, let's say trilingual. And what do you, what is it called when someone speaks two languages? A bilingual. Okay, and what is it called when someone speaks one language? A lingual? American. <laughs> well, add British to that. Add British to that. Anyway, that is, we've kind of gotten off topic at this point, though, it's like, um, what is the topic? Uh, it's kind of just like an international's experience abroad um and we will say like this is focusing very much on europe and western europe because uh, the un world tourism board says that i think there's something like 1.6 billion tourists in 2019 most of them i think 67 percent were going to europe so europe is definitely feeling the burn of over tourism um i think i think you had some statistics when we were talking pre this recording about tourist numbers to yeah so um so the thing is is like flying has never been cheaper um especially with Ryan Ryan like in Europe (laughs) um but we have cities like Dubrovnik where there's 36 tourists every one local we have Venice where there are 55,000 locals but there are 5.5 people who landed or drove you know to Venice um visited Venice in some way in 2019 um which has like a negative impact on the environment um Dubrovnik faces like lots of of course there's like ecological decay but then there's also just like cultural decay like Mm. people wearing bikinis to churches basically um 
Yeah, it's it's that thing of you've got to realise that it's it's lovely that you've come on holiday and you're spending your money is supporting sometimes local economies, but if you're going to a church, a mosque, a synagogue or anywhere of cultural significance, it's sometimes best to maybe wear a shirt. Uh, and shoes. Um maybe cover both sets of cheeks. <laughs> oh my god, no one do you know how you can't make a serious argument and wear flip flops as you walk away? Just in the city oh shop over and flip flops. <laughs> That's me. It's gonna be me later today. I'm sure that somehow I will get into political discussion. Meanwhile, I'm gonna be wearing a um <laughs> bikini with like a rom com sitting next to me and like flip flops, purple toenails. Nothing's wrong with any of these things. I'm equally as valid, but it doesn't. It doesn't uh, mean that it isn't kind of like a funny fight. Yeah, trying to argue with whilst you have a hair towel on your head, it's very hard. Uh. <laughs> that is the um, experience that we're all familiar with. Yes. I yes. think so, like, we might, like, wrap up here and just get into, we just, like, briefly, is this okay if we wrap up here? Yeah, of course, of course. I, I have things to do. You have things to do. I have food to eat. Um, yeah, my thing is to lay, to lay in the sun. Um, but we like kind of want to like end these podcasts by mentioning stories that we are paying attention to around the world. Like we don't need to get into the stories. We don't even necessarily comment on the stories, but things that we think the public should keep an eye on, especially because often like all of our countries are guilty of only paying attention to domestic news. Yeah, and so much is happening outside of our own countries. Or, um, like for instance, I guess British and the US, we're very focused on the, the special relationship again, more on the British side because we're the weaker party in it. But it's that thing of we dedicate a lot of our news to American internal politics or American just power moves on British power moves in Europe. And I think it's a travesty, I think, in academia and journalism that we seem to be very ignorant yes so um something to keep an eye on you know actually we'll mention two things at this point because um there's been some like real developments over the past few days in yeah hawaii um tragic developments that are reminiscent of colonial times and toxic capitalism Yes. Um, in terms of what has happened after the hurricanes. And yes, I know that this is like American news, right? But it's taking place in the Pacific. So we're paying attention to Hawaii and what is happening. Myself, I'm paying attention to especially what's happening with real estate people. Yes, yes. Um, if anybody oh. wants to like research this thing or called, what we're seeing is basically shock capitalism. It's where capitalism like comes in and does stuff after a natural or man-made disaster. It's by, there's a book called The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. And she speaks about the case of the tsunami crises in like the 2001 tsunami, where companies bought up beach land as soon as the tsunami like left. So history repeats itself. Um, and like, please pay attention. Like if you can help raise awareness of this, that lots of native Hawaiian people are losing their land that's been in their family for generations to corporate greed and we seem to still be sending tourists there and the fact that we seem to think it's acceptable to still go there after a huge disaster where bodies are still missing as a tourist destination speaks a lot to our our interpretation of like entitlement to tourism almost yes and then the other story, of course, we're paying attention to is what is happening in Niger and sort of the whole situation with echo loss um mm. uh, yes as former colonial powers who are still there are being pushed out um, while other powers are maybe being embraced and of course there's like um real threat to like the most important thing right is like the threat to the people of niger and the threat people to the local area that um like it's more than just international relations that's important in these cases it's real life yeah, it's, being affected it's the people and there's um like this coup belt 
could result in famines, it can result in destabilization of the whole of the Sahel region. So again, something to pay attention to, to be aware of, and also do check your news sources, like be aware that sometimes news has an agenda. So fact check it with a lot of sources if you can, use scholarly sources as well to understand the region. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we wanted you guys to focus on. Again, it's not an order, it's just something to pay attention to. And whenever this gets produced, there'll be developments. But yeah, yeah. something that's to pay attention to. Suggestions of two girlies with multiple degrees <laughs> who are passionate about these, these um, paying attention to these things. Read World Affairs. Um, yes. Yes, read, read Fox and read CNN and read NBC, read everything. Read BBC, yeah. Like, read read everything, like, take everything with a grain of salt. So I think that's the big thing. I don't take everything for face value. Um, but thank you so much for tuning into our first episode. Uh, we hope it goes well. We hope there's more after this. So we'll see the reception of this and how well it goes. Um, we'd love to hear your suggestions. We'd love to hear if you want to be on the podcast to discuss this topic. Um, our DMs are open. You can find us on uh, at she has a point pod on Instagram. And our Gmail is she has a point pod as well. And yeah, also, on. we have, oh, sorry. TikTok is she has a point podcast. Oh, yes, the TikTok. Uh, the TikTok. Um, so, we look forward to hearing from you guys. If you want to like comment on us or fire us some questions, we'd love that too. Um, we should be on Spotify, hopefully at some point. If, if you're listening to this on Spotify, we've figured it out. And we should also be on YouTube as well. Like she has a point podcast. Um, so yeah, we look forward to seeing you all in the next one. <laughs>